having us again this year. Uh, last year we presented a, a talk uh, in this same room and we're really, really happy to share this new story with you. So the story I'm going to tell with my uh, uh, colleagues here is how we switch from a MySQL database to a Gar database, namely Neo4j, in the context of uh, an inquiry, so it's science, uh, trying uh, to do some new philosophical uh, um, theories. Yeah. And um, so basically our talk will be a story about how we did a long refactoring process. Um, yeah, sorry to introduce uh, my, uh, my uh, uh, colleagues, Guillaume Pick over there. We both are in the Media Lab Science School Research Lab. And then Guido, who worked with us for a long time, and then switched to uh, Luxembourg in the DH Lab, uh, DH Lab in the CVCE. So, uh, Bruno Latour is our scientific director of our research lab. Um, he is basically a <coughs> French uh, philosopher. You could tag him with philosophy, anthropology, and sociology of science. He is famous for one uh, for having uh, developing one theory with uh, some colleagues of him. Uh, some colleagues called actor net network theory. Um, so, if you see in this talk uh, some you know, some concepts that can be uh, uh, related to this theory framework, I'm really interested uh, to, to, to hear you about that. I'm not sure we why well, we try to get inspired by this theory. But um, yeah, I would like to thank Europe. Um, we we spent some money from Europe through the ERC uh, that Bruno Latour won a few years ago. So thank you Europe for uh, uh, featuring us today. Um, so the inter intellectual project, the research project we, uh, we participated in, is called an inquiry into modes of existence. Uh, we call it AIM. Um, it's an, if I have to sum it up in one sentence, and I will not tell more about this in this room. <laughs> it's, it's an anthropological inquiry. So it's like an anthropologist who will not have a look into some cultures in the um, Amazonian uh, uh, um, forest or in, I don't know, places in the world. It's, a, it's, a, it's, it's actually an anthropologist who look at what we call the modern society. They try to describe from the anthropological point of view what does modern mean. If you want to, learn, to, to, to know more about that, you have one link here um, to a recent publication our colleagues in the project published recently in a design review. And if you want to learn more than that, there's a book you can uh, buy, uh, make a book. It's in French here, but it's also available in English, in German, in a lot of different languages. And this book about philosophy has one very particularity, which is that you will not find any footnotes nor glossary inside which is something kind of weird in um, the humanities. The project started with a book published, and then we organized a series of workshops to, to discuss with uh, uh, other uh, 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 social scientists or the, <coughs> the philosophical points made by the, the author of the book. Uh, that's a picture of an example made in uh, um, 2014 in, uh, in London. And I do think that the talk we do now is part of this series of workshops. And um, basically what we add to, uh, to, to this research project on our site is uh, that we developed the web platform. Uh, you can access to uh, this through this uh, URL. looks like that. And uh, in this uh, uh, web platform, you can um, learn more about the project, of course, and then you can access the book, as you can see. And if you do so, this is what you're going to um, experience. So you have three columns. On the, on the left side, you have the book. You can read. It's the exact copy of what you have in the paper. You can read it. You can find links to uh, vocabulary. You can read, of course. And then you also have links to documents, which you don't find in the, in the book. And so documents can be multimedia, <coughs> like slides or pictures. But you can also go back to the vocabulary and explore this vocabulary. Then you reverse the symmetry, and you can find all the part of the book that cites this precise vocabulary. And you can go back to the book and go on with your reading experience. Right. So, what do we have as data model? Uh, 
to, uh, to support such uh, uh, an experience, web experience. So we have three columns, we have three kinds of objects, text, the book, book, vocabulary items, and doc, documents. They all share um, uh, um, a structure of a hierarchy of contents, chapter, containing subchapters, containing paragraphs for the text, book item containing paragraphs for the book, <coughs> and documents, which contain paragraphs, slides, and multimedia uh, resources like PDF, pictures, video. Yes. And so, um, as, you, as, you, as you've seen in the previous slide, actually we also have links. We can uh, uh, add to one particular paragraph in the, in the book an anchor that says that this particular phrase, sentence, talk about this vocabulary item. You can do also links from the vocabulary to a document or from a paragraph in the book to another document. So we have hierarchies and links. Okay, so let's try to um, describe the MySQL domain, uh, model uh, we used in production. Presentation. Okay, so we had, um, I simplified the schema here, I just focused on the items uh, I talked about before. We have users and other kind of stuff like upload in media and uh, table like that. I just focused on top three and uh, fourth one. Book item, um, so how do, how do we put the hierarchy of contents into one uh, single uh, uh, MySQL database? We use a tree where actually every content has an ID, of course. So a paragraph, it's a, the, the smallest one, has an ID. And then you have three uh, important uh, uh, fields, which are root, left, and right. With a root, left, and right, and an ID, you build a tree, tree of contents. And we use the same uh, structure for the three items. Book, book, book. Now, what about the links? The links are all stored into one table called link, in which you will find information about which paragraph is citing which items. To implement that, we have this model. Um, the links that lines are dashed because they are not exactly what we can call a MySQL constraint foreign key because if you look at the beginning of the table fields, you find an ID. Okay? Uh, you have a from ID and a from root, but you also have a from model. This variable indicates which table to uh, target when trying to retrieve the ID and the root. This is for the incoming. And from the outgoing, we have two ID, two root, and two model. I don't say this is what people should do. This is what we do. Okay. Now, um, in the train coming to Brussels, I said, "What if I was even recrafting the query in SQL that would produce the content of the book from the MySQL and the schema I showed you?" This is what I ended up with. Basically, with this query and three with three joins, I can have a CSV with chapter column, such as a column, paragraphs, minutes, stored as a multi-valued in one cell. I don't know if you like this well. Um, yeah, of course, I use uh, CSV my image to extract this query. Very little for my OK, and just to for you to understand the context, in production we had this MySQL database, but that one was wrapped into a PHP framework server. And we are not really in on PHP. So, to, so, I thought about the MySQL database, but actually we had more. We also had a solar index, uh, because we wanted, we wanted to implement full text search. Uh, we had a Mongo database um, because at some point we wanted to add a new uh, web interface to the same data with a new developer. He couldn't bear using PHP MySQL, so he did, uh, let's say, a new project um, connected to the same data but using Node.ts and Mongo. And, uh, oh yeah, we have another MongoDB uh, wrapped into a Python twisting server 
for handling bibliographic references. And we have a SQL light database for the blog, because the blog was, uh, has been uh, uh, implemented through the Ghost uh, uh, software. Actually, we forked Ghost because it was wrong and it works. But many, uh, but as we can. And the Microsoft access that, no, no, that's a joke. <laughs> we don't have this project, but actually I have one in another project. Um, but I might tell this story later, uh, this year in July, in another conference. In, uh, I hope if my paper is uh, accepted in DH uh, 2016. Okay. <coughs> Sum up the stack. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so this is what we had at some point in production, and we had some extra money to say like, let's let's, let's do something a bit easier to maintain, All right? So this was the plan. But to explain it better, um, I'm going to, to broadcast um, uh, Do we have sound here? Um, I can do without the sound if you like. Try it. Okay. We'll see if it works. So I had to explain our plan to refacto as a lead dev to our product owner, who is actually the scientific director of the network. And this is a video our uh, uh, project manager took when I explained that. Okay, no sound, but you can read it in English. We need an admin. Um, so, we had MySQL, we had this uh, context, and we thought about the project because we thought about it for uh, some time. We started in uh, 2011. Um, we had to build a, to build a web folder, and we hesitated. We were hesitating between a solution in Java, pure Lucene, and a Neo4j. I asked the guy I hired to make a, um, a comparison between the two, but he couldn't do it, so we did a pure Lucene. Then in spring 2012, <coughs> uh, well, um, at the beginning of the project, I wanted the developer to test the Neo4j. Couldn't do it. Not the, with the skill to do it, so we switched to MySQL. Um, and then in summer 2012, the first intern experimented it. Then in summer 2013, the new intern here uh, tried it. And then finally, in fall 2014, yeah, let's implement pain in the project. That's where the second part of the story starts. Okay, so now uh, we used to have uh, multiple databases and now we are going to use only one to root them all, which is a Neo4j database. So, several thousand lines of code later, to switch the ancient data model into the newest one, we have Neo4j. So, Neo4j is a graph database, but I think you are all fairly acquainted to it. Uh, this means that you don't store tables, you create nodes, you create edges, etc., etc. So, you store your data as a graph. So, knowing the ultra relational nature of our data, it was kind of a fit. So, let's try and see if we can do it. So, migrating. So, how do we go from the scrappy MySQL schema to the new one that could better fit our new database? Okay, so this is now actually the schema that we have in Neo4j after the, uh, the old one. So you must remember the old one in uh, MySQL. So now we have books, which have a series of chapters, which have a series of subheadings, which have a series of paragraphs. 
And then you've got vocabularies, we also have paragraphs. You've got documents, we have slides that can have media or paragraph, and those media can be referenced. So this is basically the new model. It's a bit simpler, it works, and actually the real model is more like that, but we will skip because it's not really interesting here. So, what kind of problems and what kind of choices uh, had, um, did we make while migrating the data? So, there is, I will speak here about only three things. So, first, how do we handle a series of ordered links in F4J? Because this is not actually very straightforward. So, how do you store a series of, uh, of ordered links in F4J? Uh, the second point would be how. Um, there are some uh, specificities of the MySQL uh, data now not relevant in a new uh, data bound model which is a project and therefore a graph. And the third point would be what, uh, how are we going to handle translation because we have a version of the book in English and a version of the book in French. So how are we going to handle this in the J specifically? <coughs> so on the subject of order links. So remember, we have, a, uh, we have a book. So this book has many chapters. Those chapters have many sub-chapters. And the sub-chapters <coughs> have many paragraphs. Uh, I think you will acknowledge that uh, it's better to read the book in the order it was described in the beginning, because otherwise it don't make sense. So we have to find a way with nodes and edges to actually have this order in the database. So how, do we, how are we going to do that? So solution number one, we are going to make what is called continuation relationships. So um, the query here is Cypher, so it's the query language of Nail4j. So actually we have chapter, which is linked to the first subchapter with a link which is called starts with. And then all of the subchapters have a link to the next one by a next link, etc, etc. So the advantage is here that, uh, that it feels natural. The write, uh, writing to the database in this fashion is quite easy, but drawbacks are that it is quite slow to read and it is quite strange to recompose because we are going to use unbound queries which are actually a recursively uh, grasping of the data we need, so it might be a bit slow. So therefore we have this, the, the second solution that we are going to use in the book, which is relationship properties. So in a graph database, you can attach uh, arbitrary properties to your edges, and so we are going to tell, okay, this edge is actually the first one, and this edge, is, this uh, other edge, is actually the second one. So we are going to build our edges like this, and so with a simple query, we are going to recompose the order of the list afterwards. So the advantage is here is, is that it's quite easy to read and recompute, uh, the drawbacks is that it may get very costly if you want to write a database because you might uh, get in bad use case where you have to rewrite all the links to match the new order. Okay, so actually we chose the second one for reasons. So we only found two main solutions, but uh, there might get other solutions. The thing is, some people uh, even say that uh, maintaining ordered links in the graph database is kind of an heresy, but uh, we have a book and we cannot really <coughs> do otherwise. So let's handle the heresy. And, uh, so if you have other solutions, we'll be, uh, we'll be very glad to hear about it. So now uh, we have to come back to the documents. So the documents in the book are organized as a sleep. So you have one document, which has many slides, and those many slides have, have many elements, which can be media or text paragraph. <coughs> so the idea is, uh, should the slide node still relevant? Is the slide node still relevant in our new data model? The thing is, at the beginning, the slide was a design principle, which was dropped later on on other interfaces, and uh, which was uh, mainly uh, an obligation made by the MySQL database. So do we need to conserve it? So we have many solutions. So is this an artifact and should we drop it? So should the document be only a list of elements? Or uh, even should we uh, grasp uh, all the presentation of the node and skip it into Markdown and put it as a property of the node and then uh, just link to the relevant uh, part of data we need to link? So actually, we did not uh, choose to drop the slide because of legacy purposes. But the question remains. So this is the kind of question you are going to, to, 
to handle way when you try to use, pass from a data model to another one. So uh, the third question: What, what, how are we going to handle translation? In the original MySQL database, you had one row per paragraph, and one uh, property was the French version, and one property was the English version. Uh, so the problem here is that you are going to really tightly uh, bind those two versions, and if you want the two versions to drift apart and become uh, arbitrarily different, you are going to have issues. So what we did here is not uh, stuck thing, uh, not store the properties in the node himself, but split in two nodes. So one node is actually the French paragraph, one other, one other node is actually the English paragraph, and they are linked by a translation link. So then we can drift apart, and so we can add uh, new translations very easily because we don't have to add properties to nodes, and we can uh, make different versions of the book very easily. So this is the third point we we tackled. So now that we have we know how, uh, approximately what you need to do, so we are, we are going to migrate. So how do you monitor this migration? Because the process is quite hard, and what you want to ensure is to do so comfortably because this is very uh, outlet to do so, and ensure that no data is lost within the process because we don't want to lose data. So, therefore, we need the properties to help us <coughs> achieve this objective. So, on the legacy side, it's quite easy. Okay, we have PHP, MySQL, it's quite uh, legacy now. So, you've got a huge and very useful tools such as PHP MyAdmin, RoboMongo, etc. It's quite straightforward. However, monitoring a graph database, which is quite a recent concept, uh, is another problem altogether. So how are we going to uh, monitor the data in the graph database? So the obvious solution is to use the Neo4j admin. So I'm not sure if some one of you are acquainted with the admin, but it's a very good tool. It has very good UX, so it's very easy to handle, etc. It's very handy to profile, explain your queries, uh, have a sense of what they are going to return, etc. And they can give a, a fine sense of the local geography of a node, but only the local geography of the node, and this is very important. So, there is a problem. <coughs> Neo4j admin is a very fine tool, but it cannot display it cannot display large graphs, and obviously the book is a very large graph. So how can you grasp the totality, the whole of your graph? And uh, it only has a basic Spring layout, which won't handle correctly the complexity of our whole database. So uh, the problem in the end is that we cannot use visual, visual network analysis on our data. Thing is, uh, in the laboratory, we use visual network analysis on a daily basis to handle several problems. So why shouldn't we use this tool to handle uh, such things as a, a migration? So what is visual network analysis? Uh, graph as an object are very mm. complex things, the very symbol of complexity. And the thing is, humans handle this complexity very badly because it overcome our cognition capacity. So we cannot very handle this complexity easily. So what are we going to do is we are going to visualize this complexity. We are going to use data visualization tools, and we are perform. We are going to perform a visual analysis of this graph and trying to understand some things about it in its geography, which can help us in the process. So to do so, we designed a very proof of concept tool, which is called Agent Smith. Uh, it's a proof of concept. The idea is to be able to apply this visual analysis on large graphs and on large graphs coming from size of queries or near 4 database. So it aims at being a complementary tool to the admin, not a concurrent one. So it's obviously a matrix pun about Agent Smith, Mr. Anderson. And so uh, how are we going to handle rendering? So SVG, which is used by uh, the admin, is a very useful tool if you need to easily customize or uh, draw graphs uh, the way you need. Uh, the thing is very less performant than other uh, techniques. So here we are going to try to use Canvas, WebGLs, etc. So we are going to use a library which is called Tegma.js to handle large graphs. Uh, on the layout side, so a layout uh, is a, a way to properly specialize the node of the graph. So uh, the thing is that this uh, spring uh, layout is more cosmetic than accurate, than really accurate. The thing is, its goal is only to ensure a naive and tight collision of the nodes and to display them evenly in a board and to be able to handle the small graphs. 
So uh, for our use case, we are going to use Force Atlas 2, which is a layout algorithm, uh, algorithm uh, made by someone who is just here in the room. And uh, we are going to give more meaning to the graph geography and understand the graph. So I'm completely aware that it is a bit blurry, so I'm going to try and show you a very specific example to see how we can use this tool to uh, spot inconsistencies in the data. So first you state we are going to find duplicates in the page. So, uh, so this is actually the tool. So I'm going to type in, uh, type in a query whose goal is to retrieve documents in the database who has only one slide and whose slide has only one item which is a reference to a Bible uh, bibliographic uh, text. So I'm going to run the query. And here I've got a graph, which is a bit specific. So you've got a lot of uh, components everywhere, and you should notice that there is a clear pattern. So, uh, let's zoom a bit. Here we've got a reference. This is a slide, this is a document. So why do we have two stems? It's because we have the French version of the document and the English version of the document. So normally, we should only have those patterns in the whole graph. The thing is, you should quickly notice that it's not the case. We have this strange starry thing, and if we zoom a bit, we will discover why. So this is actually a reference to some text, and here we've got the English document, here we've got the French document, and here we've got the English document again, and here we've got the French document again. So we just discovered and explored uh, duplicates in the database by visualizing the graph we just made. So, one duplicate, two duplicates, and there should be a third one somewhere here. Okay, so this is the first example of how we can use network visual network analysis to spot inconsistencies in the, in the data. Um, so now we're... Okay, so we are... So this example is a bit more tricky, so we are going to do a different query. <coughs> Let's assume the book has a, a list of specific themes it explores. And uh, of course, uh, those themes are linked to uh, paragraphs of the books, documents, um, images, etc., etc. So let's draw the graph of those theme here. So, let's see. Let's do it. Okay. So, let's zoom over here. Unfortunately, the colors are a bit uh, shady. So this is actually a uh, mode. So treat it as a theme, which is the political theme of uh, the inquiry. And uh, here, for instance, you have a, a little balloon which is composed of um, documents, paragraphs, uh, etc., which are linked to the theme. Uh, here you might not see it clearly, but there are other nodes here, which are uh, greens, which are documents specifically. So we have to come back on the um, what does a layout algorithm do? Uh, the idea of a layout algorithm is to put nodes which are uh, highly linked, close together in a, in a 2D representation. So what we are learning here is that those documents are more linked to the mode than they should, because they should uh, actually there should be only one balloon of uh, data. So this means this document is more linked to the mode than this. This is not consistent because there can only exist one link between an entity and the theme. So what went wrong? Actually, I linked twice the French document to the theme because I fucked up in my uh, node matching. So we are going to fix this. So this is actually the curve before. You have to look at the line uh, 388. And we are going to fix it. OK. So before, after. So I just spotted an inconsistency in the data, and I was able to fix it by analyzing the graph and spotting where the problem was. So here is for the second example. Okay, to, um, to, to sum up this, uh, this part, so now we have an L4J, we have data in it, we make sure the data were consistent, thanks to visual network analysis, and now we can do the same uh, query I made with my scale at the beginning of the talk, 
with the cipher. This is what it looks like. <coughs> and uh, also to sum up with a new stack. So this is to be compared with the first uh, uh, um, schema with all the arrows. Um, so now we just have the famous blog here with the scale light still here. Um, the Mongo in Python is still there with the graphic references. And all of the rest is only one Neo4j, one non GS Express server, and three different HTML5 uh, interfaces that use the same API. The three ones are um, the book uh, interfaces you, you, you've seen at the beginning of the talk, another one that I didn't talk about, and <coughs> the admin, the way to edit data. We will not talk much about that. So now, let's uh, uh, give uh, uh, the mic to Daniele, who would explain us how he used Agent Smith and Neo4j for another uh, uh, research uh, project. One year ago, I left uh, the Media Lab crew and I joined another team, that is the team in Luxembourg, the CDC. Uh, but then I bring with me uh, all the, uh, the experience we accumulated, especially this agent meet that we were just uh, developing at that time, and the new 4G. Uh, especially because the shift was a sort of uh, a big uh, shift for me, not only because of uh, the, the city were uh, far uh, distant, but also because they were shifted from philosophy to history. So I had to uh, work with historians, and uh, my task, my job, was to develop a web application that could handle and could uh, uh, help people to explore the connection between the uh, documents that this, this center, which is uh, a research center on, uh, on the European integration process, uh, store in uh, their archives. So basically they have a huge collection of pictures and documents that deals with uh, people uh, from the Second World War on who tried to uh, build up uh, the uh, European Union. And moreover, was, this is uh, one part of the task. The second part was uh, there is already an existing workflow and uh, uh, the task was to merge these uh, two needs. So uh, from one side there is the need for exploring the, the possible connection and the other one was to refine the data, data creation process, so how the metadata are attached to these documents. And finally, one last, which is uh, an ongoing task, is the, how to publish effectively this connection, how to, to make it visible. So uh, the idea was to use, of course, uh, at the very beginning, at least, uh, in order to explore this uh, complex universe, uh, was to use Agent Smith and uh, Neo4g. Uh, what I did, I did for the like um, um, I'm interested also in uh, text analysis, among other things. And then uh, I use this Yango Ida, which is an entity ambiguation tool uh, made by Max Planck Institute, that basically takes a, a text uh, and from a text you extract some uh, key elements like uh, location or uh, or persons uh, or some entities that appear in the Wikipedia. <coughs> Uh, and basically what I wanted to do was to display this uh, richness, so this possible connection, and, uh, and also to, to monitor this analysis that was ongoing. We had more than uh, 18,000 documents, so uh, we could relate to, to errors like uh, we saw before. So then basically the, the structure I use is far, far simpler than uh, AIM. Uh, we have one document on the left, one document on the right, they are both interview, and they're both connected because there is an entity that appears in, uh, in both documents. So it's very, very, very basic. And you can see there is a Paul Colovod that appears uh, in both, and it could be linked to other two entities that are underlined. So basically, I start uh, putting everything in, uh, in the OPG. Uh, uh, the, uh, the brown nodes uh, are the, um, the documents and the blue nodes uh, are the person in this case. Uh, the, the brown documents are letters because uh, we have collected a lot of letters exchanged between uh, some key actors. And finally, what I discovered that uh, this tool can also be used for data creation because uh, 
Okay, that is uh, this is for later. Uh, but then uh, there are different, uh, also different uh, overview on the, this uh, collection based on uh, which kind of relation do we, do we have. Uh, these are uh, persons that co occur in the in pictures, like in the caption and in the title that uh, people on the road. But then we can find them, uh, the, which are the main topics. So for the exploration part, we can also have uh, an overview. But what was uh, important is that this corpus is multilingual. So as AIM, uh, we have two different languages, more than that indeed. Uh, we have uh, till uh, five or six uh, translations for one document. And what I did, uh, I run the, um, this ambiguation process in parallel uh, for French or for English in order to spot the best candidate for the, the person, for the, the person that should uh, link uh, the two documents. So basically, w uh, I use then uh, Agent Smith also to spot uh, which are the persons that are not here in the two languages. So I assume that the translation were correct, they were complete enough. Uh, and then what uh, was interesting enough is that by using this difference in languages and visualizing it in uh, this uh, with this layout, with this specific layout, we can spot really very. Uh, subtle errors like Robert Schumann, which is a person, the blue node, but then it's not a person. So this graph is a graph of errors, and it could uh, also uh, help us during the data curation process. Then here the symmetry that we saw in the uh, we can see in the in the layout can help us also in disambiguating these people. So, uh, if we have a huge archive, a huge collection, this could be uh, this visualization could be also a nice tool to create uh, this archive. So, basically, this is the the, the question that I'm uh, like after a year uh, that I'm still uh, wondering: Are this kind of visualization, the graph visualization, useful uh, for uh, for uh, sorry uh, for uh, a fast data creation process? So, by visualizing patterns of errors, patterns of uh, mistakes, can we help them in a uh, reassemble and show the, the real uh, complexity of the system without all the noise? Uh, well, we have uh, uh, these three, uh, we can spot asymmetries, we can spot the well-placed uh, false positive because of the degree, so we can spot errors that are uh, in, the, in, this, uh, in this collection. But also Neo4j provides us with a, a full text using search that is really, really uh, useful, especially if you want to, ch to spot your error, to, to check if your, uh, what you've done is correct enough. So basically, for annotation error in the layout, we can see if there are some, uh, uh, some persons which are not persons, so the disambiguation method is not accurate enough, but it's not uh, a problem, because then we can just spot it. And within this uh, tool, which is an admin tool, we can correct automatically the uh, the error. Or we have, uh, like in this case, the false positives. Uh, we have a person that uh, again uh, appear together, and we have a sort of patterns of error. So there are something strange that is happening in these three uh, documents. Indeed. But then uh, the, uh, the graph that I provided were not uh, mm, refined enough. Sorry. And then I start. Uh, uh, I use the uh, new project to build up uh, monoparted projections. From so before we had a resource uh, uh, to entity links, uh, and now we want to have only entity to entity because the, the idea is to find connection between these people. Uh, so basically, I uh, I calculate the chapter similarity between uh, the person in this case, and we end up with uh, this kind of network. And then uh, other question uh, rose, because what does this uh, relationship mean? Like historians, I was working with uh, this researcher, they told me that it's not normal that we have these two people that appear close. What does it mean, real uh, relationship? And then uh, I, I think about that this kind of tool can also help the researcher that uh, is not a specialist to work with uh, this kind of uh, technology because uh, then you can just uh, decide visually which are the relationships that are needed 
or not. So we start uh, uh, thinking about, uh, okay, we can transform uh, the relationship between person to person uh, uh, if they appear in the same picture or if they appear in the same, uh, in the same letters, for example. So it was, uh, everything was a sort of negotiation with the researcher. But it was nice because everything was open up. This is important because uh, uh, within this layout, within this graph visualization, what we open up.